Hi, I'm John Allen, the editor of Crux and a media and communications fellow at the Word on Fire Institute. Recently, I published a book with the Institute called Catholics in Contempt, how Catholic media are fielding today's fights in the church and what to do about it. We are going to take advantage of Bishop Barron's presence here in Rome for the Senate of Bishops on Synodality to talk about the culture of contempt in today's media and what the proper Catholic response to that ought to be. It's going to be a fascinating conversation, so please stay tuned. Bishop Barron, first of all, let's focus on the irony that this is basically your show. I yeah. mean, this is your media space, <laughs> but I'm interviewing you, so you're basically renting me your audience for free tonight yes, uh, in an act correct. of extraordinary <laughs> generosity. So that's, thank That's exactly right. <laughs> at the end of a long day at the Senate, I'm happy to have you interview me instead of the other way around. <laughs> so uh, I recently did a book uh, for your institute, yeah. the Word on Fire Institute, uh, on Catholics and contempt. Right. right? Uh, and the idea that there is a culture of contempt uh, in today's media environment. Now, you would think, having done a book like that, that I would have a handy dandy, nice and neat definition of contempt with mm. which we could begin. Truth of it is, what I've got is the Potter Stewart test. Uh, I'm not sure I can define it, yeah. but I know, you know it when it, I you, see it. Hear it, or see it. But, but let me start with this. It, it seems to me that media contempt is about not just attacking ideas, but attacking people. Yeah. Uh, that is, when you have someone with whom you disagree, it's not enough merely to reject their idea or to critique the idea, but you have to con uh, critique the decency and the integrity of the person yeah. propounding that idea. Does that seem to you like a good working definition yeah. of contempt? I do, and I, one of the problems, John, I think is people don't know how to have arguments anymore. What I mean is to formulate a real argument to bring evidence to bear, to assess the evidence, to take your opponent's position seriously, even to steel man it, to respond to objections, et cetera, to draw conclusions in a reasonable way. That's called an argument. And most people, I find, don't even know how to do that. So the fallback position, the default position is, well, you're an idiot, I'm gonna attack you personally. And right, and that's where the contempt side comes in. Nothing in the world wrong with disagreeing with someone's argument and making a counter argument. My hero, St. Thomas Aquinas, was a master at that. Avoided the ad hominem always, you know, the attack against the person. Thomas never does that. He'll try to dismantle someone's argument or show a flaw in it. We've lost the art of argument, which I've been saying for a long time. And we default to this um, facile ad hominem uh, style. That's the problem. By the way, anyone who ever wants to say Catholic clergy in the 21st century are out of touch, I just want to note, you just used the phrase steel man yeah. uh, in a phrase. Yeah. Uh, so clearly you're in touch with the argot of our time. Uh, so let me ask you this. I mean, you are a very high profile person yourself. Um, I, I mean, you know, your YouTube videos generate millions of views. You did the Catholicism series that is one of the most celebrated TV productions about the Catholic Church in our time. Um, and although all of that has played basically to overwhelmingly positive responses, I mean, you know, you have also drawn some fire publicly sure. uh, and ironically enough comes from both the left and the right a lot. Um, so you yourself have experienced yeah. what we might call the culture of contempt. What has your experience of that been like? Uh, and, and when you experience that, in other words, when you feel somebody's not just attacking your argument, which I know you feel is fair game, right. but yeah. when somebody's attacking you personally, how do you respond to that? I remember in the early days when I first started on YouTube and I put these videos up, I didn't even know that people could make comments on YouTube videos. And you know, I, I was excited when we got 300 views, and, and I'd look and say, oh, oh my goodness, people have actually made comments. And of course, especially in those days, most of the commentary was extremely negative. If people, this was the, the high water mark of the new atheist period and anything about God or involving the church. And I, I was appalled at first, I must say. I wasn't expecting it. You know, I was moving before that in the world of academe for the most part. I was writing books and articles and, you know, engaging in high-level conversations and, and listening to counter-arguments. <laughs> when you do it in this more uh, you know, popular setting, you're gonna get this sort of negativity. So at first, I was sort of appalled by it. Then I, I got accustomed to it and got a, a thicker skin. And what I decided to do was take advantage of it. 
that at least it gave me a, a toehold. So I, I send something out into the ether, you know, and back come these comments. And I don't even know who these people are. There's no name attached. There's no face attached. But there's a human being there. They hate me and they hate God or hate religion. But at least I can connect to them somehow. So I started to use it. Once I got over the shock <laughs> of being personally attacked, I started to use it then as a way in. You know, to say, hey, well, you know, okay, fair enough. I get that. But what you're missing is X, Y, and Z. So that's what I did, um, you know, in the beginning. Something I'm actually proud of is that I do get attacked from both left and right. And I, I would dare say more than maybe any other major public Catholic figure, I get it from both sides of the spectrum, which I'm happy about. Because I, I think it does show that I've staked out, and I've said it, you know, I stand in the great Vatican II tradition as interpreted by the great post-conciliar popes from Paul VI to Francis, um, the Catechism of 92. I mean, that's where I stand, and I come out of that perspective. Well, you got the hard left and the hard right. Both hate that tradition. So fair enough. You know, bring it on. Does it sting more when this kind of criticism comes from within the Catholic fold? People that, in a sense, you would think ought to know better? Yeah, I think, it, I think that's fair to say. And, you know, it's terrible to say in a way, but I think it's true. The nastiness is greater coming from inside the Catholic world than from outside. I think at one point I said some years ago, Give me my early atheist critics any day over my Catholic <laughs> critics. Because they, 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 were, they were obnoxious in their own way, too. But there was something particularly nasty about the, the intra-ecclesial Catholic stuff. And so let me ask you, do you think that is different today than it was, say, a decade ago or two decades ago? I mean, you know, your lifespan overlaps that of six popes, right? You were born when John the 23rd was pope, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, I, I was born when Paul the Sixth was pope, yeah. right? And so we've both seen we've some water a lot under of the popes. bridge, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I mean, you know, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, Paul the Sixth, like some of the criticism that came his way, particularly after Umane Vitae in 1968, yeah. was incredibly vicious. Yeah. I started my career at the National Catholic Reporter in the 1990s, and some of the things that were being said on the editorial pages of that newspaper about John Paul II and then Cardinal Ratzinger at the yeah. Congregation for the Faith, uh, you know, were fairly contemptuous. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and so the question is, is there anything different about what's happening today, or is it simply louder? Yeah, I would tend, I think, to that latter view. It, everything's been made worse by the social media world. What I mean, not everything, I mean th this problem of, of critique and contempt has been made worse by the social media world. The ease with which you can uh, send something out. Uh, you don't have to write a letter, type it out, find an address and a stamp and send it to an editor. You can sit in your mom's basement and you can just type something out immediately. Which people actually do, of course. By the way. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the anonymity of it, that you can do it without getting yourself personally in trouble and, and an immediate reaction. That's made it worse. And then that is like this sort of terrible, toxic <laughs> waste dump, you know, because this comment comes out and then, wait a minute, and then someone comes back and then, and then a, a mob might form around it. That's worse now, yes, than it was, let's say, when John Paul II was being attacked by his left-wing critics. It, it's worse because of the social media environment. But worse in the sense of it's simply more ubiquitous or do you think the culture itself has become more toxic, more acrimonious, more unrelenting? Yeah, I do because the social media has begun to shape us. So it begins as a tool, and this is always the case with you know, great technological advances. It begins as a tool, and then it starts to shape us. And so, yeah, I do think it's the ease with which we can communicate our invective to others, the ease with which mobs can form, uh, and social media has made the whole environment worse and has made those of us who participate in it worse. I think that's true. Now, I mean, human nature is human nature. People have always been you know, fallen and obnoxious and difficult with their enemies. But this environment has exacerbated the situation. You know, I mean, I, I, I will freely confess that among many of my colleagues, I am seen as something of a dinosaur because I am very anti-social media. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I always say that, you know, I don't know if you ever played the game Asteroids back in the day, yeah. but, you know, this video game, yeah. they had something called a smart bomb where you could, like, I think two times during the game, you could press this button and just wipe everything away and start yeah. over. Like, if I had that capacity, yeah. I would press that button now 
and go back to a pre-social media stage because I do think yeah. it has had a kind of toxic impact yeah. uh, on our, our interaction with one another. Now, of course, that's unrealistic. You can't do that. Right. But I, I do think, you know, I mean, McLuhan, right? The, the medium is the message. Yeah. I mean, no technology is value free. And it does seem to me that social media inculcates a certain set of values, which is rapid response, yeah. right? I mean, you mentioned Aquinas. Yeah. You know, Aquinas famously said that cognition is a three-step process. There is experience, there is reflection on experience, and then there is judgment, right? So you experience something, you think about it, and then you reach a conclusion. Yeah. It seems to me, in the world we live in in social media, that intermediary step of reflection has just been eviscerated. Yes, and that's, that's tied to what I said about argumentation, that people don't know how to make an argument, because argumentation depends upon the process you're describing. And in the measure that that's disappeared, the capacity for real argument has disappeared, and so we default to this rather toxic, you know, uh, position. That's a cultural thing. I mean, teaching people again how, think of Lonergan, you know, who was a great student of Aquinas. Be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, and then be responsible. <laughs> the four steps in any uh, responsible engagement of the world. Be attentive. What's actually there in front of you? Be intelligent, meaning try to understand it, see the form. Uh, be reasonable means make a, a judgment, as you say, a correct judgment about the nature of things. And then be responsible, act in accord with that judgment. That's a real spiritual discipline. And Lonergan, who was an uh, epistemologist, but he was also a spiritual teacher, that's a spiritual practice. And the social media, I think, does indeed undermine the requisite spirituality, right? to make an argument and to engage somebody in a creative way. Um, see, what I think about argument is when, when you're appealing to some objective truth, you're finding something that will link you to another person. So it's not like just my private set of convictions are against yours, so I'm gonna attack you because you don't like me. Can we prescind from that and say, no, you know, together through argumentation, we're seeking the truth. And if we find it, it'll link us together. But, but that's, the, that's a spiritual discipline we're talking about. And that's lacking in a lot of the social media culture. Do you find, like I've always thought that <clears throat> in a way the magic bullet to cut through all of this is friendship. Yeah. Like when, yes. when people become friends. Yes. Like it is just so much easier to demonize a stranger than a friend. Yeah. Right? Um, and the problem is we have become such a stratified culture that it is increasingly difficult. Well, in other words, you are swimming against the tide if you want to create friendships with someone who doesn't yes. already share your world. Right. right? So the question is, how can the church be a place in which these zones of friendship can be carved out? It can be a pl what, it sh what it at its best always has been, a place where the virtues are inculcated. And one of those virtues is a kind of intellectual virtue, grounded, as you quite correctly say, in friendship. Because friendship means the two of us together are seeking a transcendent third. So we're not just either admiring each other or fighting with each other, just one to one. Together, we're looking to a transcendent third. In this case, the truth, the good, the beautiful. And, and in that measure, we get closer to each other. That, that's the irony of it. The, is the more we forget about the, the one to one and look to the transcendent third, the closer we actually get. That's the bond of friendship. And Aquinas will say that. You know, in love of the truth, friendship is, is, uh, is inculcated. And the church should be a place where that's happening, where we're learning the disciplines. We, we do the exercises necessary to make that friendly quest of the truth possible. Uh, yes, the, the church can and should, which is why it's so sad when church people are demonstrating just the opposite. I've said, and I, I actually have scolded whatever you know, impact I have on the Catholic social media world, but I've scolded people by saying, do you realize an honest seeker after uh, Catholic truth, but what is this Catholicism all about? I'm going to go on social media and find out. I'll go to a website. And what do they find? Catholics just you know, yep. attacking each other. How massively disedifying, how completely unevangelical that is. If they saw us as friends, together seeking the truth, you know, disagreeing, uh, refining each other's arguments, terrific. But if they saw us that, that we're 
we love each other. That would be evangelically uh, provocative. You know? Now, let me ask you about the difference between righteous anger and contempt. Mm. I mean, in our tradition, you know, there is a strong emphasis on righteous anger, yeah, right? Sure. I mean, we, we can look at the Old Testament prophets, yeah, the prophets right? right? I yeah. mean, read Jeremiah. I mean, he could be fairly contemptuous, sure. right? <laughs> uh, Hosea, right? I mean, you know, uh, whether we're talking about kings or emperors or yeah. even, for that matter, their own people who they felt were failing to uphold the obligations of the covenant, right? Um, so this idea of speaking truth to power of, sure. of legitimate outrage uh, yeah. against hypocrisy and corruption, Right. Right. And I know from my personal experience that when I've tried to engage in what I guess we would say is fraternal correction, right? When I try to call out a colleague yeah. saying, hey, you know, you kind of savage that guy. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe you could have been a little bit nicer about it. I mean, the usual response I get is, you're telling me to pull my punches. Yeah. You're, you're no. telling me to, you know, uh, to, to not speak truth, right? Uh, and so how do you think about, even from a spiritual point of view, how do you think about the difference between legitimate outrage, right? Because Augustine famously said, anger is the daughter of hope, right? Yeah. Uh, there is a virtue to anger, yeah. right? Yeah. So what is the difference between the legitimate outrage and contempt? Legitimate outrage is the passion to set things right. So it's a, a subset of justice that you've seen a great injustice and you want to correct it and you have a, a passion to do so. So it's, it's born of love. Love means willing the good of the other. So if I see an injustice, there's some evil being done, and I wanna, I wanna will the good to that person, I might be filled with righteous indignation, like the prophets, like Jesus famously in the temple and so on. Um, and that's a good point of demarcation. If I'm not in that frame of mind and spirit, then I've probably defaulted to real contempt, where I'm now just venting my spleen. Um, Aquinas refers to anger as this sort of irrational desire for revenge. And look, we're all sinners. I mean, I, I've felt that. I know exactly what it feels like. When someone's attacked me, I, oh, I want to get back. <laughs> but see, it's irrational because it, it's not a, a, a passion to set things right. That might be, hey, let, let's talk this thing through. And, you know, you, you were really unfair to me and let's work on this. That's okay. That's, that's righteous anger if you want. But anger in the sinful sense, the deadly sin of anger, is a irrational desire for vengeance. That's the point of demarcation. You've got to do a lot of introspection to look really honestly at your spiritual attitude. Do you, one thing I've told people online is you've written something and you're about to press the you know, enter button. Can you honestly say, I've done this out of love? I'm willing the good of the other. Now you might, and it might be even very sharp language, like you know, correcting somebody. Or, but can you say honestly, I'm doing this because I love that person. I want to set something right. Or let's be honest, 90% of the time when we hit that button, it's out of an irrational yeah, desire for vengeance. Yeah. So then you say, okay, don't do it. Unless you can say, yes, I'm doing this out of love, don't hit the darn button. Yeah. You know, Look, don't send I, it. I don't have your audience, okay? But I have been in the public eye myself sure, yeah. uh, for more yeah. than 20 years. Yeah. And if there was one infallible lesson I have learned about responding to criticism, yeah. uh, it is that I have never, ever regretted being gracious in the yeah. face of criticism. Yeah. I have often regretted yeah. being defensive. Right. Right? Right, but I mean, but we're, we're all fallen, we're all sinners, and so we have these deep instincts in the wrong direction. Um, think of, you know, the old spiritual masters talking about the, the way our desires and our emotions are all messed up because of sin. And so, I mean, why do we feel so naturally this irrational desire for revenge? And why is real love so difficult? Original sin, yeah. maybe it would be... Right, and that's the right answer. <laughs> and, and the church has always known about that. And, and we let that doctrine sink in as well, that, all right, all right, I, I, am, <laughs> I am so marked by this, you know, concupiscence, this, this, my, my emotions are messed up, so be careful. You know, be aware of that. And uh, I, I remember that famous line from <laughs> Chesterton, right? Uh, you know, this is the. There's so early, many. Which one? Well, Chesterton? the early 20th century, right? Where he said, you know, the modern science is very impressed with the need to begin their speculations with a fact. So, well, Christianity begins with a fact as plain of pota as yeah. potatoes, which is the fact of original sin. Yeah, there it is. I, right? I, I, I feel it in myself all the time. And social media brings that out. I mean, it presses yeah. that button on it, bop, 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 yeah. bop, all the time. 
um, I mean, I feel I all the time. You, you, you've done something, you've written an article, you've done a video, and then someone makes a obnoxious comment. It's just uh, 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 it's just pressing this this button in your own psyche. So we got to be aware of that and and seek a, a detachment, and interior freedom. All the Which old requires time, disciplines, right? Yes, I mean, and, and, and that is one. That's the commodity that is missing in the contemporary media environment, right? Yes, when we live with perennial immediacy. Yes, but it takes a real spiritual discipline, and and that's the ultimate answer, you know. And it's not an easy one. Um, you know, do you censor things if people are saying bad things about you, or do you work on yourself? Do you work on your own interiority, your own spiritual freedom? Um, that's hard spiritual work. But that's well, you raise the issue of censorship. I mean, let me yeah. ask you, you are a bishop of the Catholic Church, uh, and therefore you were charged, in a sense, with, at least in your own diocese, with distinguishing yeah. what is authentically Catholic yeah. and what is not. So let me ask you this. Suppose there was some Catholic media outfit that you felt was toxic, that was feeding a culture of contempt, that had somehow set up shop uh, in the diocese of Winona, Rochester. What do you do? I mean, do you try to sanction them? Do you call them out? How do you engage them? Well, the different things you can do. At the limit, you can take away their kind of status as a Catholic organization. As a, a bishop, I could do that. I can't really, you know, stop them from broadcasting. But I do think a bishop has a legitimate monitoring responsibility. We do it with textbooks. We do it with uh, catechetical programs. We do it with university professors, you know, with the whole mandatum. So I, I don't have a quarrel with that. I think bishops should monitor the Wild West quality of social media space. You know, there are a lot of very irresponsible people out there in that space. And sadly, a lot of Catholics get their information and their formation from people who are, <laughs> are patently unqualified. So I, I don't really have a quarrel with that, that a bishop could, I, you know, you do it different ways. You, you'd follow the mandatum, like you give a special sanction to certain uh, out, outfits and refuse it to others, or but, but in some way to monitor the space. I, in fact, brought that up at the Synod here, because I think uh, that's, if we do it with books and, and catechetical programs and universities, why wouldn't we do it the okay, social Okay, but just to space? play devil's advocate for a yeah. moment, which, of course, that office has been suppressed, but nevertheless, <laughs> yeah. uh, just to trot it out for purposes of this conversation, yeah. uh, I've covered the Vatican a long time, and I have seen instances in which theologians, for instance, have been sanctioned in some sure. way by the Holy Office, the, the congregation now that they cast free for the faith. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can recall cases in which theologians whose books had sold a yeah. couple dozen <laughs> copies right. now sell suddenly get sanctioned yeah, by the sure. Vatican, and all of a sudden they become sure. international celebrities. Sure. And, uh, and so the question is, don't you worry that the, like, the long arm of, of officialdom reaching out might actually end up being counterproductive. Yeah, it could be. And it's a case-by-case -case thing, probably. Yeah. But that's why I say some kind of shepherding or monitoring of your own uh, diocese. I think that's a legitimate thing. You know, I, I, and before you get to that point, call the person in. You know, have a good conversation with them and say, look, why are you saying X, Y, and Z, which are clearly, you know, repugnant to the church's teaching or clearly harmful to people? So there are steps you can take before you get to the point of, you know... Of and have you sanction. tried that with people that you have considered responsible for contempt? I have not. Uh, I, for the first time now, I'm bishop in, in my own diocese, so I'd have that kind of authority. Prior to that, I wouldn't have had the authority to do it. Um, but I think there are steps, that you, preliminary steps you might take, you know, before you get to sanctioning somebody. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, this is something I have thought about, you know, for a long time too, right? Um, is when you have a situation in which the church is, and I don't think it's polarized, we use that word, yeah. right? But, but I don't think that's accurate because that suggests that everyone is clustered either into the left or the yeah. right. I think what we actually are is tribalized. Mm -hmm. Like, because if you increase the magnification, right, uh, on, on both sides of the aisle, what you will find is, you know, you've got peace and justice Catholics and yeah. you've got church reform Catholics and you've got liturgical traditionalist Catholics <laughs> yeah. and you've got you know, neocon yeah. Catholics, right? And they all inhabit their own little universes and they have their own heroes and they read their own blogs right. and, and they go to their own conferences yeah. and they don't really have much to do with one another, right? Um, and so the question is, you know, how do you puncture, right, all of that? Um, and, it, you know, m my experience would suggest that chiding people about it, generally speaking, doesn't produce positive effects. 
Um, like, it, you know, I hate to be naive and a reductionist about it, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have become an advocate of the better to light a candle than curse the sure. darkness yeah, yeah. philosophy, yeah. right? And it's just better to show that there is a different way uh, yeah. of doing things than to explicitly call out, and even worse, to try to sanction through, you know, impositions of authority, right? Yeah, again, I would say case by case, you know, because some are so egregious that something has to be done or something has to be um, Im imposed or, or people start doing real damage. But to your, your broader point, I, I quite agree with that. I, what I've tried to do in my own work, relying on my, uh, my mentor, Cardinal George, you know, is just Catholicism. <laughs> As you say, all these different types of Catholicism, there is a kind of mere Catholicism. You know, which is, I'd say, it's the classic stuff. It's the, it's the truth and the beauty of the fundamental uh, realities of Catholicism. And I've kind of traded in that. I, I've not, for the most part, gotten into the tribal warfare scene in, in the Catholic Church. My Catholicism series, on purpose, didn't go into hot-button right. issues. And right. a lot of people were urging me to do it, from both the left and the right. And I, I refused it. Um, I wanted to, to bring out these really fundamental and beautiful, compelling features of Catholicism. And I've tried to be positive. I mean, I, I mean occasionally I might um, write an article with a little polemical edge, but I, I tend to be positive. I tend to look for the seeds of the word within the culture and all that. And I, you know, I found that to be a better way to do it. And at the end of the day, this effort to go positive, what I will often hear from colleagues uh, when I talk about this uh, is, you know, that's pie in the sky stuff. That's not where the market is. Right. What they will say yeah, is right. uh, that in the media market in which we live, it rewards of course, the yeah. kind of attack dog of style yeah. uh, of things yeah. uh, and does not reward uh, efforts to claim the common ground. I mean, you know, the theory is politically we live in a time in which the middle has disappeared, right? Uh, and all we have are the hard edges on either side. Now, it would seem to me that in a way the story of Word on Fire contradicts that hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, what you have done uh, is you have built a phenomenally successful media operation, not just by Catholic standards, but even by secular standards, yeah. that hasn't reflected that hard edge. Right. So what is your diagnosis of the market really? Yeah, I think that's right. What you said at the outset, certainly even the way that the, the machinery of the system is set up, it favors polemics and it favors you know, it's like the car wreck by the side of the road. Oh, everyone wants to pull over and look at that. Uh, what are they fighting about now? But I, I've just trusted that if you bring forth the truth and the beauty of the tradition, people will find that uh, compelling. Maybe not immediately. It might take time to build up the interest in the audience. But I, I think, yeah, you know, posse sequitur essay, as the medieval said, you know, that, that possibility follows being. So if it is, it must be possible, you know. And we prove that, that you can do it. Um, if it has been done, it can, been, yeah, can be done. If it really is, then yeah. it must be possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I'm happy about that. I'm proud of that. I think we, we took a path that people urged us not to take. You go back to the early days, you know, be as pop as you can. That was one suggestion. Uh, you know, not wear a Roman collar, come in on a skateboard, all that nonsense. Uh, but then also this, this path, you know, be, be polemical and, you know, take on your opponents and attack people. Um, no. So we, we tried to do it, I think, in a responsible way, and we did find an audience. Now, of course, what you're doing is evangelization. What I do is journalism. Yeah. Do you think the same principle applies? I mean, is it possible to treat contentious, divisive issues in the life of the church in a respectful yeah. way? No, and I would say with you, Paul say sacred or essay. <laughs> you do it, therefore it must be possible. Yeah, we don't um, have we don't quite have your audience, uh, no, but no, we but, do exist. But you know, things, yeah. I mean, we're both old enough to remember the you know Walter Cronkite and David Brinkley, and and I, I long for those days. Yeah, when the news was the news, and you didn't really know what the private opinion of the person was, and there was an objectivity, there, there was a um, there was a certain calmness in the way things were presented. I mean, I, I can't watch much of the news anymore. I, I love politics and, and current events, but. I can't watch those shows because they're so, the, the bias and the, and the polemicism is so off-putting to me. Bring back Walter Cronkite, and I think he, <laughs> he embodied that style. It was done seriously. It was done objectively. Never perfectly. Everyone's always got a certain bias, but at least they were, they were uh, defaulting in that direction. 
So, Bishop, last question. At the end of the day, Catholicism isn't contempt. It is, in fact, the precise opposite of contempt. Right? It's the effort to perceive and to celebrate the inherent dignity, the beauty, and the truth, however limited or partial it may be, right. in everyone we meet uh, yeah. and in every expression of human culture. Right? And the famous line, nothing human is alien yeah. to us. Right? So my question to you is, why is it that this culture of contempt, despite that great truth, why is it that it has taken hold? And where do you find hope that this is a passing phenomenon that in the end will correct itself? Well, it's taken hold because we're sinners and because that's all been exacerbated by this new form of, of social media. I think that's the answer. Um, the hope, I think, comes from our redemption. It comes from Christ. It comes from the church, that, that people are not just destined to be stuck forever in the, in the cycle of sin and retribution and hatred, but there really is a way out, and the church is meant to be a haven for that. So I find hope in the saints. I find hope in the sacraments, hope in the preaching of the church, which is, again, why it's so sad, you know, corruptio optimi pessima, it's so sad when it's precisely the Catholic space that can become so poisonous because the Catholic space is meant to be the source of our hope. And I think it is. It's from the saints that we always take hope. You know, you speak about the Catholic space. I mean, you know, well, our pretense is to be evangel evangelizers of culture, right? Yeah. But the truth is, in many ways, we are actually evangelized by culture. Sadly, right? yeah. uh, and the way in which we treat one another in the public conversation in the church is often exhibit A right. for that phenomenon. Right? That, yeah, that's the sad thing. You know? I mean, who positions whom? And I, I'm with the post-liberals and saying you know, that Christ must always have that positioning relationship to the culture. It, it, you know, it's not just Christ next to the culture, not just Christ absorbed by the culture. It's Christ who positions the culture. As Vatican II says, you know, we read the signs of the times in light of the gospel. It's in light of Christ that we interpret the world. That's the right attitude for Catholics to have, is, is we see everything through the lens of Christ. Well, look, I mean, when, when I am asked by people, when I'm on the lecture circuit or I'm yeah. on TV or just in casual conversation, when people ask me, where does my hope come from that we can have a public conversation about Catholicism yeah. that is beyond contempt? invariably, I mention word on fire. Oh, good. Because it seems to me yeah. that like, of all the different, you know, sort of expressions of Catholicism that are on offer in today's media smorgasbord, yeah. uh, at least in the English language, like, not only are you non-contemptuous, but you have succeeded yeah. by being non-contemptuous. Uh, and that is a remarkable accomplishment. I appreciate that, John. I do very much. And so for what you have done, Bishop, thank you. Well, God bless you. Thank you for that. So uh, the book is Catholics at Contempt, How Catholic Media Fuel Today's Fights in the Church and What to Do About It is published by the Word on Fire Institute, which is, of course, the brainchild of Bishop Robert Barron. Uh, Bishop, listen, much luck uh, in surviving the rest uh, of the Senate of Bishops. Remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Right. Conserve your energies. <laughs> You're right. All right. Thank you for being with us. Good night. <laughs>